That's what I would have said. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Ready to get started? Let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. How was lunch? Everybody tired? Taking a nap? No. Right? Um, I'm Ben Johnson, and hopefully you all came here to talk about cars for about 45 minutes. Yeah? Sure, why not? All right. I like it. How many people are car guys? Collect cars, work on cars, play with cars? Mm, tough crowd. Tough crowd for me, Jeff. Well, I have a car. Well, that's a start. Do you know where the hood release is? Yes, I do. That's another. Are you the Snap-on We are a company owned by Snap-on Tools, yes. Our company is Mitchell One, and we are a major provider of repair and diagnostics information to the automotive repair industry. And so what we're going to chat about today is kind of our journey from being a traditional publisher up to having a MarkLogic data store that's serving up a whole bunch of information. So in there, we kind of talk about cars a little bit. Because we want to talk about cars from the context of our users who are the professional mechanics that hopefully you guys are taking your cars too to get them serviced. And you want to make sure that those guys have the best information so that they're servicing your car properly. So with that, I already introduced myself. I'm the director of product management at Mitchell One. So I have uh, the dream job for a car guy is that I, I, have, I have owned a shop. I have worked in lots of shops in my younger years. I've been product manager for a number of companies. I've developed a lot of products, all with the eye towards how that technician is going to use that product and how it's going to make his life better. And if his life is better, then my life gets better because he wants to buy more things from me. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So, uh, you know, if I was known for anything, I, it's not just cars, it's anything with an engine. So I designed the diagnostic system for Harley Davidson Motor Company before I came to Mitchell and a few other things. But uh, kind of a car guy at the root. I'm one of those guys that coming out of high school just was, uh, when you asked me what my favorite subject was, it was auto mechanics class. And um, my whole life has been around training and developing product for that industry. I'm joined with a guy that's not a traditional car guy, so we're going to get a little bit of a slack. But he's, he, he buys into the club because he actually owns a, uh, a nice classic Firebird convertible. So we, uh, we let him in the club. You want to just introduce yourself, Jeff? Uh, Jeff Weir, Senior Director of Product Development at Mitchell International. Um, eight years as Ben's Step Organization Snap-on. Um, last year, I was in Snap-on Diagnostics and then worked in the heavy duty space before I joined Mitchell about two and a half years ago. Um, chasing software in one form or another uh, for a distressingly long time, you know, back when things started in the 70s. Um, software guy first, did become a car guy. Um, we'll talk about my car when it gets around to me. But, you know, 10 year old life has been on the snap on guys, so it turned into a car guy. Software guy first. It's tough to be an employee of Snap on or Mitchell without being a car guy. It's not, not good. Um, so let's talk about Mitchell. Mitchell's one of these old companies that has managed to reinvent themselves. You know, they, they were started back in 1918 with the simple idea that just like fixing anything else, it's a lot easier to fix cars if you had information about the cars. You know, in 1918, cars were kind of sent out of a factory, bolted together, and when they broke, literally people were building parts for them because there wasn't a lot of availability and people were just kind of second guessing the, you know, what, eight or ten wires that might have been on the car from the starter to the switch to the watt lights. And um, there was no consistency of information. There was no consistency of understanding how long it should take to do a particular job on a car or what that effort might, uh, how much you might should charge somebody for it. So it was, very, it was a very rogue industry at that time. And Glenn Mitchell is the guy that kind of came up with the idea that said, well, if we could start standardizing and presenting information to these garages, it could make their lives a lot easier and it could help their customers because they could get some idea of what it might take to get some of these uh, vehicles uh, repaired. I'm sure Glenn had no idea what his company was going to become in later years. 
But uh, they started with their first uh, real product, which was an electrical manual, and I can only imagine that had to be like the size of a brochure today because we really didn't have a lot of electrical things back then. But you had generators and distributor points and a lot of things that we don't have today because they've been replaced with simpler electronic components. Um, the first actual Mitchell branded manuals came out in 1946 when we introduced a consolidated parts manual. Because at that time, again, this, and this was kind of focused at the collision industry. Car came in wrecked. You had no clue of what it was going to take to fix that car either, from the sheet metal to you know the body parts and things like that. So he introduced the first um, consolidated parts manual and then had a labor time guide that, that followed shortly thereafter. So you could look at the, at the estimate. And you know this really helped the insurance companies, because they could say, well, to fix this, you know, no matter what my labor rate is, it's going to take about two and a half hours. And by knowing that, then you know, me as a customer, if I know that it's two and a half hours, then I can shop around and look for the guy with the lowest rate or the guy with the best uh, uh, reputation or what have you. But it kind of helped level the playing field in the automotive industry so that mechanics could charge fair prices and, uh, you know, and, and actually, you know, really for the shop, it was them not getting burned so that they knew kind of uh, a guide as to what they might charge to do a service. So Mitchell kept growing and, uh, and you know, growing their library of products until about 2002, the printed manual was still available. So they, it's fairly recent that we actually got rid of the printing presses and moved fully to online publishing. Now when you think about that, I want you to start thinking about the way we had to do that because even with the more simplistic manuals that we had back then, and Jeff will show a, an example or two when we get to him, we had to take the, the and we, we built everything with the professional shop in mind. So let's just take a 1966 Chevy Impala. We said, well, you know, a tech by this time was expected to know how an engine ran. So we didn't go into the details of how an engine was put together. We gave them the details of how the, the torque specs for the particular 283 small block Chevy that was in that in power, what the torque specs were, what the water pump specs were, things like that. But we didn't go into the details of the basic, you know, step by step, here's how you would take that engine apart and out of the car. Because if we did, you take that Impala and then add a Nova and add a Corvair and add a Caprice and then add Fords, you'd wind up with a whole bunch of books, even in the days of simple data. So when you looked at these old Mitchell manuals, you would see the things that we felt were most important for that professional mechanic to understand that might be different than their basic core of knowledge. You know, we know how the engine works, but how does this engine differ from the standard engine? We know how carburation works, but how does this Rochester quadrajet differ from the thermo quad? You know, so we had specific information, and that's it's kind of key as we as we grow ourselves here. In uh, 1989, we actually introduced our first electronic electronically published product. And so this was a CD-based product, DOS-based. You put it in your computer, and we had a variety. I think we started with like seven or eight disks or something. It grew to a lot more than that. Um, and again, we took the same data that we had been publishing and made it electronically available. And that's really what started the revolution in the automotive industry of moving to online uh, publishing of information. Because guess what? Most of our garages have pretty limited space. And those mechanics like to fill that space with tools. Well, the books are an important tool, but as these vehicles became more and more complex, you started needing more and more shelf space to fill with these books, right? So then, in 2001, we actually had been acquired by Snap-on Tools, and we took our electronic information online with what we call Mitchell On Demand, which is still alive today. So it started in 2001. As of 2013, you can still get that product. We still have about 50,000 plus users that subscribe to that product uh, even today. And I guess I just talked about that. So over 200,000 technicians utilize our stuff to help fix your cars since nobody fessed up that they would work on their own. And to that, just as a history on, on Mitchell, we've expanded our offering. So we actually offer end-to-end -end solutions of shop management systems. These are the systems where you call and schedule the appointment. They plug that in when you actually sell something in your shop. It's what, it's what records the sale. It's what measures the technician productivity. It's what measures you know, your profitability of the shop. It does all these things. And we actually, so we have the 
the service write-up and uh, scheduling software. We have the actual information to repair the vehicle software. And we actually have CRM software where we go back and let that shop stay connected to their customers and help them maintain that vehicle long term. So we do a number of things now, all focused at this automotive industry. Um, well, I should say at the vehicle industry because we've also expanded into the medium and heavy duty truck offerings with our information. So we are, this is our, what we do. We don't, it's not a sideline, it's not a, a, a product line within a bigger company. This is what Mitchell One is all about. Now, vehicles, while we've been going through our evolution, the vehicles were changing too. So largely in response to government pressures, better emissions, better fuel economy, things like that, we started adding technology to these vehicles. Remember until about 1979, 1980, vehicles are a pretty simple thing from a mechanics perspective. But then the computer controlled ignition came along, actually it started in about 1975, moved into the um, onboard computer, was adopted pretty much across the board in domestic cars for 1981. And these started, the computers started controlling the carburation back then and then fuel injection today and you know, transmissions, the braking systems, the ignition systems, everything else until you've got a pretty complex car today. In fact, even in the last 10 or 12 years, we've exponentially increased the amount, the amount of technology on this vehicle. As this slide shows, we used to average one to three control modules on the car. We had the engine controller and then we had the analog brake controller, and then more recently we started with the transmission controllers, the um, HVAC controllers, the vehicle stability control systems, uh, upwards to where the 2008 F-150, this isn't the fancy Escalade, which is up here, but just your F-150, you know what, some of us still think of the old farm work, work truck, had 20 electronic control modules on it, with over 50 sensors, 40 actuators, things that the computer actually controls, and three different networks, vehicle networks on them. And so, pretty complex vehicles, even just your basic work truck. When you look at something like this, this is actually a, I think this was a 2011 Escalade block diagram I got from Delphi Corporation, just talks about all the technology that's on here. So, I was actually in a meeting yesterday where one of our, um, one of our guys actually has a Cadillac, not the Escalade, but the, uh, SRX, I think, David. David. And he was describing how, you know, and this is the fun of it, right? He comes in with his keyless entry system and pushes a button just wrong, and suddenly the car just goes dead. The dash won't respond, nothing works. 20 minutes later, it resets and it'll start and run just fine. Well, guess what? Somewhere he confused some network of systems in there, and, and there you go. And we're seeing more and more problems like that on these newer vehicles because the vehicle is actually an assembly of parts from different manufacturers. So Delphi might manufacture the air conditioning system, Vistion might do the engine electronics, Bosch might do the uh, ABS systems, and you know all these things have to kind of interconnect and inter interlock. So it's, a, it's pretty complex, and in fact, as I show here, some of your really high-line cars, like your BMWs and things, have upwards of 70 electronic controllers on them. In fact, BMW is fun because one of the things that's happened with all this technology and all these little problems that I'm talking about is this thing called reprogramming, where just like our, our computers here, where we see the little flash that says you have updates available, where there are updates that are engineered in after the car is put into production where they realize that, oh, if a guy pushes this, does that, winks once, suddenly the car won't start, they engineer a fix for that and that'll allow the, the shop then to download a program and install that program onto the onboard computer systems. Well, the BMWs in Austrian, you know, smarts, if you want to call it that, decided that all the ECMs have to be reprogrammed at the same time to make sure that everything's kept in sync. So if you're at a BMW dealership and your BMW happens to need a reprogramming event, they will tell you to bring it in in the afternoon and leave it overnight, and they will start the reprogram before they go home, and it'll be just about wrapping up when they show back up the next morning. The average is seven and a half to eight hours to reprogram a BMW right now. And that's on their proprietary high-speed network. Anyway, so when you look at our product, this is our legacy On Demand 5 product. So this, you get, you got to imagine, coming from a print world where we consolidated information and editorialized it, the way I talked about, so we didn't have these big, huge books. We only had what was needed. Well, guess what happened when all this electronics started getting on the cars? Couldn't do that anymore. You needed it all. 
So what we do at the, at the core of it is we license the information from the people that build the cars. General Motors, Ford, Subaru, Toyota, Honda, Hyundai, Kia. And we take that information in whatever format they distribute it in. We go through a process where we commonize that, that content so that we can get it into our databases and then we produce it back to our customers that, that subscribe to it. So this is an example of that On Demand 5 product that's been around for a decade now. And kind of the way it looks, and it hasn't changed much from a 1990 Caprice to that 2012 Escalade hybrid because as you know, we had things very grouped, you know, back in, you know, starting with like 1940s, 1950s, we had fuel systems, electrical, engine, there wasn't a lot else. And we tried to figure out how to stuff all these modules into these category, categories and keep it as trim as possible. But what happens? You know, when you're in a publishing business, especially one that's, that's a reference tool, and let's just take, let's pick on General Motors for a minute. I already picked on BMW. General Motors has this thing called OnStar. We've all heard about that. You push the little blue button and the magic woman comes on and, and helps you with whatever your, your problem is. Well, if that OnStar system goes down, where do I look for that in these categories? Is it an accessory? Is it electrical? Is it general information? Is it maintenance? Is it, I don't know. And I pulled my product team one day and we came up with three or four different answers to that. And I told them everyone was wrong. And they said, well then, Mr. Smarty, who's right? The technician, because he's gonna have every, he's gonna be thinking about all these different things too. So this technician over here may think it's electrical, this guy over here may think it's an accessory, this guy over here may think it's an engine problem. And so our challenge in life is to make that information findable. Because while all this has been going on, we used to process thousands of pages per year, and we were proud of that. We went from thousands of pages to tens of thousands of pages to hundreds of thousands of pages. Last year, we processed over 1.8 million pages of OE content, normalized that, and got it into our databases. And so, you know, I use the analogy that you're a technician, we've got the information. Here's the haystack. It's in there. Have fun with that. Not the right answer, not the right response. So our challenge was to reevaluate what we had done, how we had evolved from this print world to the online world, and think about how we were going to not only thrive, but survive in this new world. Because there are new players coming along that didn't start with our legacy and baggage. They started with newer technologies, newer ways of thinking about it. And we had to really, if we were going to survive and, and grow in this business, we had to think about it. And, you know, now we talk about it, we think we were in the big data business, at least in the reference of the automotive world, before anybody was even talking about big data. Um, and so we did that. We stepped back, we thought it through, we thought about our life as car guys and how we should see the information and how we could find the information and how technicians would relate to what we wanted to do. And we envisioned the way that we would want to support those customers. And we called into Mark Logic as one of the big data providers. We researched a lot of organizations. I'm not going to say anybody was worse or better than anybody else, but however we came to it, Mark Logic were the people we chose to help to partner with to get us through this journey. And um, I've got to say, they've been really, really good about, uh, about helping us understand big data in some ways that we hadn't even thought about it. Um, so, you know, when you think about how we had done things, how we had grown, how we had started with SQL and, you know, taking all these data from all these different sources and categorizing it and bucketizing it and putting it into common formats, and you take that world and you say, hey, we just adopted a not only SQL data store that really thrives on unstructured data, get, get over it. Um, I think we'll turn it over to Jeff who will tell us that that's an interesting journey. Did you have a question before we got into that? You know, I think you're probably going to get to it. Okay. I was just going to really ask why, you're, why you chose of all the folks you looked at, Mark Logic versus uh, you know, anybody else. Was it because they had a, a document-oriented database, because of the analytics, because of the way they ingest the, and index the product? I mean, what is it about Mark Logic that was the, uh, you know, was the aha that said, let's go with them versus the other 
And I think it is a good time to segue to Jeff because the, the decision was actually honestly made before I showed up at the company. But I think the answer is yes to everything you just said. I'm not. <laughs> turn, turn the mic off. Yeah. So, having said that, I showed up right after the decision was made. But I understand why it was made. So the first thing you're going to notice is, geez, all these Mitchell guys have colds. That's because we care about the consistency of the audience experience. The moment I knew Ben had a cold, I ran out and got one just so you guys didn't have to adjust your listening techniques to the guy with the cold and the guy without the cold. That you know of. So, um, as Ben said, lots of information out there. So, the volume of content is escalating. The, uh, these numbers are a couple of months old now, so I apologize for that. We're actually at about 14.2 million pages in the general vicinity of 6.4 billion words. Um, and every time I ask my guys how many words do we have now, they give me this really disparaging look and right, you know, they trudge off and come back a day later with a number. Um, the types of content are, are going crazy. You know, it used to be you'd get some text and you'd get, you know, a couple of drawings. And these days, it's multimedia, it's images with hot spots, it's SGML, it's 23 flavors of, of XML, uh, because, you know, God forbid that any two OEMs should deliver things to us in the same fashion. Uh, the sources are multiplying. There's new OEMs every year. Um, people are coming in from the Chinese markets. Uh, technicians, we've got now, I want to say, on the order of 250 technicians that every day sit down and kind of document, here's the new or interesting or strange things I saw while I was under the hood today, so that we can take that, capture it, turn it into experience-based information, and get it out there so that when other technicians see the same thing for the first time, you know, we can give them a clue about what's going on. Um, analytical data from repair shops, we have now, from our shop management systems, about 290 million repair orders. And you can think of a repair order as, you know, the intersection of a person and a car going to a shop and having something done to the car. It could be an oil change. We don't pay too much attention to those. It could be, you know, they saw these codes on the car with the engine light was on and you ended up replacing these parts. So when you have enough of that information, you can start to do some interesting things with statistics to say, here's what's going on with that car out in the real world today but it is a lot of information and the volume's growing. So, Ben mentioned I'm an honorary car guy. That is this. This is the repair manual for my personal car, uh, 1967 Pontiac Firebird convertible. I live in San Diego now, so it's great fun to have this. Um, everything you needed to know, 400. Everything you need to know, uh, it's a Holly Street Avenger. Uh, recent four barrel upgrade. Three on the, it's three on the tree. Or automatic, I'm sorry, automatic, yeah. Three on the tree, automatic. Yeah, automatic. Not, not the shift on the tree, but just a three speed automatic on the tree. Yep. So everything you needed to know in 1967 to fix that car. Yes, of course. It's Southern California. How could it not be a convertible? Come on, man. Everything you need to know to fix that car is in here, as is evidenced by some of these. When I get brave, you know, there's actual, like, greasy thumbprints in here, because I, I can get under the hood of that with a fair degree of confidence. Um, so that was sort of the state of the art in 1967. Around 1994, it was starting to get interesting. That is a Lincoln Mercury slash Ford Thunderbird repair manual. Technically, it covers two cars, but really they're basically the same car with a badge swap. So you could think of that as one car's worth of data. Um, this is around the time that all the new systems were starting to come in, um, engine controllers, ABS, very early days of that sort of thing. That is the last set of physical manuals ever delivered to Mitchell. That is a 2009 Camry. That's one car's worth of information. Right around this point, if you wanted to get the printed manuals for every car that might come into your shop, you're not going to have any room in your shop for anything but the manuals. They would fill the shop. Um, it is a lot of information. That is a 2011 Mazda Tribute. Um, we printed that one out for our own purposes. 
If you printed it out in the same format as the Camry, the stack would be about twice as tall as the Camry. Um, and good luck finding anything in that, right? If you wanted to look up the heating and air conditioning system, it kind of evenly distributed through all three of those big blue binders. So you're going to spend a lot of time flipping pages and going through tables of contents and indexes, uh, and you're not going to have a very happy result. At this point, you know, the, the amount of space the printed, physically printed material would occupy is almost irrelevant. It's, it's a warehouse. It's, it's not going to fit in your shop at all. So it's not a needle in a haystack, as Ben said. Now it's, it's kind of a needle in a giant haystack of needles. And you'll have all these people searching for things. And you've got like this one guy over here who's actually happy because he stumbled over the right needle pretty much by luck. And so what's in that data store and sort of, you know, how have we come to deliver this online? Um, an article you could think of as a chapter in a book. Um, the OEMs give it to us and it'll be, this is sort of the chapter on how the water pump works or this is the chapter on how to remove something or how to install something. They're not particularly coherent pieces of information as much as we'd love to think so. So we've got, now the numbers are about uh, 214,000 narratives and that's anywhere from a couple of pages to a couple of hundred pages. Uh, we've got about 107,000 technical service bulletins and recalls, and that's that little thing when you go into the shop and they go, oh, you know, they pull up the little three-page thing and go, oh, yeah, I've got a warning about that because, you know, your airbag thing's wrong, and so I'm going to replace that part for you free. Um, and then 15,000 and some odd maintenance schedules, which are sort of dull, but, you know, it's the time to replace your oil, time to look at the timing chain, time to inspect this, time to bend that. Images, we've got about 6.2 million most of those, again, sort of associated with the articles. And that's anything from um, a picture of, that says, here's the tire rotation pattern, all the way up to an exploded view of a transmission. You know, so there's a pretty big spectrum of complexity in those things, a wiring diagram, schematics, all kinds of things. And they all get managed slightly differently. Um, when it's all broken down, not counting images, it's about 16 million MarkLogic documents. So it's what we refer to as a document fragment. And what we've tried to do is break those articles down into the smallest possible meaningful piece. So it might be two paragraphs about the location of an O2 sensor and the picture that goes with that. So kind of an atomic unit of information, if you will. Um, that we can then rebuild on the fly. So how do we describe that? There is a very tightly controlled taxonomy that we manage. We have a taxonomy manager, actually we have two. Um, there's preferred terms and those tend to be the ones from the Automotive Society of Engineers. Uh, that reminds me, if, if anybody that didn't know all the car guide terms from Ben, I've double checked on Google Translate, they are available there. So if you didn't get what he was saying, you can find it there. Um, so they used to describe components, which is about, you know, now it's up around 13,000. Diagnostic trouble codes, which is pushing 68,000. And information types, which is, we've got about 98. And information type, think of those as verbs, right? So it's going to be inspect, adjust, remove, install, replace. Um, so we've got kind of a whole bunch of nouns and then a handful of verbs to describe things you might do to the nouns. Um, and we've got non-preferred terms, and those tend to be OEM specific because we just can't have Chrysler and Chevy both calling an identical part and alternator. Just won't do. They've all got to have a special word for it. And the technicians don't really always know the special word, so in our taxonomy we have to manage that. So when they say alternator and we go, oh, he's looking for a Ford, so it's really generator, okay, you know, we'll go find it. A um, lot of management around there. Codes don't have preferred terms. Um, they are very, very, very specific. It's a, a letter and then four-digit number, and they are extremely explicit. So there's no alternatives to what those are. And then spatial references, because, you know, change the shock isn't specific enough. Change the window motor isn't specific enough. So you have to have references like left, right, front, rear, top, bottom, to identify what point in the car you're talking about. So what do we do with all that? Um, 
We take those and we ingest them into our editorial data store. So to the point um, Gary was asking earlier, that's where we do a lot of our semantic tagging and it's one of the reasons we work with Mark Logic is as we're bringing these things in, we can run them through a series of algorithms and say, okay, you know, based on sort of looking at this article, we know it's about removing, we know it's about this year make model engine. We figure out some other things so we can sort of categorize that for retrieval later. Uh, Yeah, yeah, and one of the things they do very, very well with Mark Logic is they deal with kind of unstructured data. And if you've ever had to sort of mess around with taking data from a bunch of sources and getting it into one, most of the time you actually end up investing to take all the data and massage it into a common format and then stick it into your data store with Mark Logic. And it could be with others. I mean, I've just got experience with Mark Logic, quite frankly. I'm an old, old school DBA, you know, DB2 Oracle. Back in the day, haven't written any code in 10 years. Uh, but the thing it took me longest to get my head around with Mark Logic was they don't care about the structure of the XML as long as it's a valid structure, valid formed XML. Um, you have to do some basic declarations around it, but it's pretty flexible in terms of how you manage those sorts of things. <coughs> we then use a flexible replication. We send it out to the data centers. Um, there's two, there's a primary and a backup both brilliantly located on opposite ends of California on a fault line because those will never go off at the same time. Um, and then we use that enrichment, that semantic tagging, to reassemble larger documents on the fly. So to go to the um, air conditioning and heating uh, uh, analysis I was talking about earlier where it's spread through all those manuals, what we do now is somebody types in HVAC and we go out and we gather everything that's semantically tagged as belonging to the HVAC system and we assemble that into a set of documents for the, for the user. Uh, we're looking at the use of triple stores to start to bridge some of the gaps and types of content because we've got historically like parts and labor, right? So there was a room full of guys working on parts information. There was a different room full of guys working on labor. There was a whole different room full of guys working on taking the OEM repair information. And so we've got sort of 35 years worth of that. And we're now starting to use triple stores to bridge the gaps between them. Uh, because we're not going to go back and update 30 years worth of content. It's just not a, it's not a runner. Um, so we use enrichment to group similar items. So descriptions, locations, procedures, diagrams, specifications. You know, we, we, we categorize those things. Um, so that they're easy to find for, the, for our users. Um, and we also use it for sequencing because if you think about a technician going on to a job, well, if I've got to do an O2 sensor replacement, the first thing I'm going to do is take it off, then I'm going to put the new one on, then I'm going to test the new one to make sure that it worked and that the systems can all talk to it. So we use that enrichment for sequencing the, the display of uh, information to the users. Um, and did this meet our expectation? Well, kind of. Um, you know, we had a building full of people that very traditional data people, right? I mean, it was rigid processes, very formal. Um, we used XQuery to replace SQL with something of a learning curve. Everybody kind of went, yeah, MarkLogic's kind of an interesting place to put our content. Um, that'll work. You know, we'll move from Oracle to MarkLogic, and it'll be great. Um, and we continued our transition. When I first joined snap on um, and I, I came in sort of through the diagnostics and tools guys and so you know the snap on culture to this day is still you know rah, rah, we cut metal with fire and everybody's like rah, rah. and then I got transferred to Mitchell I'm like man now I get to go work at the information side of the place that's going to be fantastic and I get to Mitchell and they go hey, we put ink on paper and now it's electronic ink and electronic paper but we still put ink on paper so I'm working through that transition with them, but, it, you know. Yes, yeah, XML data store. Um, and 
the product got out there, right? But we, we learned some lessons that we're now sort of having to work back through. Um, the MarkLogic Professional Services guys gave us loads of advice. They said, look, you guys really need to think differently about your data. You need to think differently about your content. You need to think differently about your delivery systems and how you build things and how you get them out there. And we went, yes, 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 of course. Um, but we've been, we've been working with this data for 95 years and obviously we know our customers and we know our content better. So we kind of said thanks for the advice and drove on. And we built our new flagship product based on our history and our knowledge. Uh, and we got a better customer experience than a legacy product. A lot better experience, in fact. Uh, but at the end of the day, we still, we, we, we didn't get it right. And here's why we didn't get it right. This is the service manual module inside of ProDemand. It is the only piece of ProDemand that uses the native MarkLogic search features, because everywhere else we rolled our own, because we knew our stuff better than they did. Um, and sort of one guy in about a month put this together using the native MarkLogic features. And so it has free text search, so they can type in anything they want. We go, we find it. Everywhere else, it's type ahead. You've got to kind of know the terms for our taxonomy or pick them from a list. Um, and here we did some things with information facets. You know, we said, well, we can filter by info type, which is not a particularly meaningful term unless you're one of us. But it means, you know, sort of what information type is. It's a DTC, is a diagnostic trouble code. It's the thing that makes a little engine light turn on on the dashboard. And then you can kind of click on what the code was. And very quickly, you get down to two articles with kind of just a couple of mouse clicks and typing a couple of words. Um, and by the way, this is the highest performance part of our application because we used all the native stuff. Um, and so that led to some interesting conversations. Um, it is the most commonly used section of ProDemand, by far, it's not even close. Even though the others are much more, they're, they're visually a much better experience. This actually, you know, to a utilitarian bunch of guys trying to fix a car, this gets the job done faster. Um, it's a go-to option for the sales and support team member. Whenever they think somebody's asking them a difficult question, this is where they go and this is the part they show off. Uh, and it leads to one of the most commonly asked questions from our customer base is, you know, why are you making me mess around with all those other searches? So what we're in the process of doing now is again partnering with the MarkLogic Professional Services people to redo our new, newly redone flagship product um, to actually take advantage of search. And we're in the throes of that now, and it's starting to look like it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ben with the accent from the cold to take. OK. Thanks, Jeff. Nice job. So where are we now? As Jeff said, we've got a Mark Logic data center. We've got a commercially available product. We're very proud. We actually had a celebratory lunch yesterday, which you missed. Um, uh, where we surpassed 25,000 customers on our new product in 14 months. So that's the strongest growth we've ever had in a product. So, um, and yet with that, as Jeff said, do we, meet, do we really meet our customers' needs and expectations? We do have a much more, better product than we had. This is an example of our old product. This is an example of I'm trying to search for how to replace the compressor on, I think it's a Toyota, uh, no, it's a Chevy Cobalt. And I'm clicking around through the systems. There's an HVAC system. Then I got to click HVAC system. Then you got a whole bunch of stuff down here that you can scroll for miles through. And ultimately, you'll get down to where there's stuff. Or you do what I did here and type air conditioning compressor. That seems straightforward. And the first thing that's shown to me is common specs, no cylinder should read less than 100 psi. Oh, yeah, compression, not compressor. A lot of problems. Here's the haystack. There's a needle in there somewhere. And ultimately, you get to the article, which even then, so now we've got our procedures, which are pretty well laid out. And then we've got figures, which are referenced. So if I click this, I'll get a picture of whatever it's telling me, this drive belt tensioner, picture of this, picture of that. But technicians are very tactile people. If they don't see that picture and see kind of what it represents, they don't want to click on this. Note that one, they click back. 
click on the next, nope, click back, click on the next. It's just not a great experience. And guess what? This is why we're not number one. We're number two in this industry right now. Not by much. We're going to catch them again. But this is one of the reasons why. So take a look at ProDemand. ProDemand component search. Same kind of thing, same car, much cleaner interface. Typed compressor, and it started presenting to me what the options were that I could select from. And here, as Jeff talked about, now I've got everything laid out and categorized and grouped the way that I want it. So I'm looking at the procedures for this compressor right now. Here's the removal procedure. If I scroll down, I'll get the installation procedure. As I scroll down here, I didn't really get this screenshot enough, but you can see that I don't have references to figures. I've got thumbnails of enough detail of the figure that I can see what it is. So as I'm scrolling down, if I want to look at that figure, I can click on it, and it'll expand out, and I can look. If I select another tab, I've got locations. Here's the component location. Click on that, it'll expand. I can look at diagrams. Mitchell is, real, is known for the best wiring diagrams in the industry. And here, we've got all kinds of tools about panning and searching and zooming and all the things that a technician needs to do so that they, can know, they know that there should be a tan and black wire on whatever that pin number is on the serial data line, and they can go measure that value. And back to the specifications. So the point of it is, is that everything I know about that subject compressor is in, within one click away from it. Now, instead of having them say, oh, well, I really need a diagram. So they back out of the article that was in the R&R &R procedure and go into the electrical and go search for it and back and forth. Really nice. Um, much better experience. Information is now findable. It does rely on a very complicated and sophisticated enrichment process, which is further complicated because, as Jeff said, we get this data in so many different formats. Enriching a GM article is completely different than enriching a Volkswagen article, as an example. I drive a Volkswagen. I can tell you it's not easy to find information about that car, even in the Volkswagen website. Um, so, as Jeff said, we're continuing to work with MarkLogic. We are overhauling it yet again. We have even a better user experience within just a couple of months from now. And that's one of the nice things about this architecture, too, is we've been able to evaluate, produce, obtain feedback, and regenerate and enhance in very short time cycles compared to what we used to be able to develop in. Um, and we'll keep doing that until we get it just the way we want it. Right now, we're looking at, as Jeff kind of alluded to, consolidating all of our search experiences down to one. I want to be able to say, I'm searching for a trouble code P0301, or I'm searching for a compressor. In the same search, I should be smart enough as a solutions provider to know what they're looking for and deliver it. And we're looking at uh, alternate content types that we'll be including into this. Today, we're serving up only information. We're also going to be serving up experience data about the vehicle. And I'm making this quick because I know we're out of time. But we'll actually be blending information out of those millions of ROs that Jeff talked about into that search experience and blending it with the OE data. And I think that pretty much wraps it up. This is just ancillary stuff talking about some of the other information that's in there that the technicians find useful. You may or may not. Um, and that wraps us up. But that's kind of how we became a 1918 company that is trying to I like hell to survive in the 21st century, and we've uh, done pretty well with it. Yes, sir. So, if I can paraphrase, it sounds like the challenge you had without coming out of the gate with a more perfect solution is more cultural than technical. Um, the way your shop thought. Do you think you could have done something better to get it better in the first round? Do you think everybody had to go through this pain to see that maybe their culture wasn't I should have made our team members this is harder to our developers. I think that's a root problem. I, I wasn't there for that, but my sense is that we made an assumption that people were going to drink the Kool-Aid a lot faster than they did. And yeah. but, you know, coming from outside, I didn't have any preconceptions, so I'm like, yeah, totally important. But then I'm surrounded by people that have been there 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And I should Since then, you know, we've gotten a lot of culture change. It was from shot now. We released working software to the world every two weeks. Awesome. Um, we're getting pretty good cycle time on yep. updates and content. I mean, somebody at Toyota makes an update, and it's out in the world two or three minutes later. So we're getting better with it, but now we're sort of building on that learning and going back and, and rethinking our basic blocking attack. 
But you're exactly right. I mean, if you were going to take on a project like this, converting from an, what I'll just call a legacy shop to a, you know, a NoSQL type shop, I think it, it's worth the investment up front to make sure the team really has enough knowledge and understanding about what this type of an environment can bring to them. So you don't, it, what they did, I mean, frankly, we took a, a great technology and we forced it into trying to act like our old technology did. And that wasn't really the best approach. But we're better now. Hey, thank you guys.